This conference will now be yeah. recorded. Don't forget the shift or give me the secondary. Yeah, let me see here. DTT, make organizer. Um, so how is everyone? Good, 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 good. Awesome. Well, yeah. nothing new here, just still busy, uh, still playing catch up, but I'm getting there. I got my shop cleaned up. I'm getting ready to have Odin properly exhausted and Thanks. hopefully be able to start pumping out some more videos soon. The, the, the calls come in in waves. You know, we can look back at the call history and like there'll be two and a half weeks where we we're slammed and then there'll be a week or week and a half where it, you know, kind of tapers yep. off and then boom, it hits again as as those shipments roll in and they hit the dock and they start getting delivered. <laughs> so it's kind of a cycle. It's, so it's kind of crazy when it's crazy and calm when it's calm. Yep. With the, like um, <laughs> it's pretty funny, though. I see some of the people commenting that they ordered like a, less than three weeks ago. Yeah, and they've already well, got them because they were sitting in port. That one was a, a sixty-three one hundred, I think. And those most people get a sixty-three one thirty. And and you know, like I was saying before, we pre-order stuff, so we might have some sixty-three one hundreds. We might have some, you know, whatever. And if it's sitting there, and no one's bought it yet. Then yeah, there may be one available. That's it's very rare. Saying that it was that fast. Yeah, very rare. So, hey Brian, I have a question for you. Yeah, man. So I got a 51100. I may have an opportunity to do a lot of cutting with my laser, specifically wood. They really want me to cut three quarter inch. Mm -hmm. I was considering bumping up to a 130 watt bulb. Is it difficult to bump up from an existing 100 to a 130? Uh, you need a, the no the the tube will just drop in the mounts are the same you will need to get a 150 watt power supply to go with that though otherwise you're not gonna get the full benefit of that tube anyway um, now what would I go buy a, another tube just to make yours hotter right now I wouldn't I would run yours at a hundred percent and get the maximum time ROI out of it and you know you're gonna burn it up but if you you know calculate that into the cost you know, like a consumable, then you should be okay and just burn that sucker up. And then if you want to go hot, get one. I, w I wouldn't go out and buy one right now and swap it just for the sake of getting an extra 30 watts, y you know, uh, at what least you, initially. What type of wood are you going to be cutting? Uh, three quarter inch uh, maple. You should like hardwood, like natural wood. You shouldn't or, even have to upgrade it. Or birch. Okay. Well, I did get my air compressor. That finally came in. Uh, that'll help a lot. That'll help a lot. That's what yeah. everybody tells me, and I still have to hook it up to the uh, to the machine. I still haven't done that yet. If I had a choice between getting uh, an external air compressor, if I had a 100-watt machine, or getting a 130, I would put a compressor on it, and I would venture to say if I ran it up against a 130 that did not have external air, I'd be right there with it. Yeah. Wouldn't, so there's wouldn't, you, be, wouldn't you be better off with a CNC machine? Cutting that thick. If I had nine grand laying around, I'd go get one. <laughs> I mean, I cut three well, quarter inch. I can cut three quarter inch oak maple walnut with mine. Mine's a thirty five eighty. I have no yeah, problem. Looks, Granted, I have yeah. to do two passes, but I'm I'm not running even full power. Is that with a four inch lens. I've done them both two and fours. I, yeah. I prefer the two. I'm faster with the two. Really? Okay. Yeah. I don't have a four, right. so. That's why I ask. I've I've been debating on whether or not I should pick one up or not. I, I just I don't know. No, I've had some stuff. I've had to jump to the four with. I just if you run into a lot like knotty or wood, if you know you're going through a bunch of knots, you're. I have found out that better jumping to the four, and just basically yeah. taking that nozzle and almost laying it on the wood. <laughs> I don't know if it's proper or not, that, but I will focus way into those. it. Yeah, that's one of the benefits <laughs> of the four is you got ten or technically nine millimeters of focal depth you can play with, as opposed right. to five, you know, with the standard two inch lens. Uh, so if it's over half inch, the four inch would, you know, probably make sense. It does. It's more forgiving on focus too, uh, so you it'll cut a little bubble. straighter. Yeah, right. Yeah. right. Um, the but there is the one thirty that we have. I mean, we're cutting, and I watched her. We were playing around with it when we first got it almost one inch thick just a hair shy of it um it the what was it about 55 on the the power for the 130 yeah and it cut almost through the one inch now we wow. switched to a four inch lens 
but we're running uh, with the four inch lens, what, four millimeters a second and um, 60% power. Mm -hmm. hmm. Nice. I mean, it's like Brian and I both, we've cut through two by fours with our 80s. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's how hard do you want to push it? Passes, but you mean, know, do you want to run, do you want to run it hard at a hundred percent and really, you know, uh, push the thing, you know, push the envelope or do you want to have a little bit more reasonable power? Like Tommy's talking about there, you know, running 60 or something like that and maybe losing just a little bit of a time, you know, that's one of those things you just got to work out in your mind, <laughs> you know, whether you, whether you ride it hard and put it up wet or baby it. <laughs> you know, it's ultimately up to you. So I was I using the four inch lens and I was cutting half inch plywood, cabinet grade. Uh, that was uh, cabinet grade Baltic birch. And we were doing 12 millimeters a second at 90%. Mm -hmm. yeah. Plywood's so that's with right. a 51 100. And, yeah, but plywood's way harder to cut through yeah, because glue. of all the glue. That yeah. glue and the composites that are in it just are much more dense and difficult yeah. to get through. I mean, I was doing, I was cutting through poplar. I was doing, I did a bunch of these at Christmas time. And I did a bunch of these as big yeah. as those were. And I was doing it on the 80. And that's three quarter. It's actually seven eighths poplar. That wasn't Nat even worth a seven natural eight. natural woods cut like butter on this machine. Yeah. Even even hard stuff like orange osage or whatever that stuff is that sparks your chainsaw. You know, that doesn't right. matter in that laser. It it I say it's orange. Better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I say yeah, that's a good the hardest part's finding solid wood in a four by eight cheese. Muted, Tommy. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, good luck with that. Yeah. There you go. Is <laughs> so it... eighteen eighteen mil one pass. Wow. Nice. Yeah. That's impressive. That's, this one this one's cherry, but it does the same. Now I will say if you're looking at cutting um ebony. Um, you might as well just use a saw because it takes three yeah. passes for an eighth of an inch ebony. Um, <laughs> I wonder why. You know, purple hearts a little bit more. It, it's about for the same thickness. It's going to be two passes versus cherry. Yeah. Oh, um, the edge that stuff leaves is incredible, though. That real black, purple looking. You can almost see reflection in it. In, in really? that purple heart on the cut. Yeah. yeah I mean, it, oh. it almost looks polished. Yeah, I'm gonna have to pick some up next time I'm at Woodcraft. And if you're ever using black limba, consider yeah. it like pine what is that? in the laser. It is so light and not dense at all. We set some on fire. Is and it real sappy? No, it's not sappy. It's just very, very porous and light. I mean, it's gotcha. the same weight as pine. Like balsa wood. <laughs> so yeah, I, we, I ruined we the lens with the engraving some really sappy cedar. Mm -hmm. Cedar smells good though. Yeah, but the, it it flames up easy because it's got so much oil in it. Yeah. Besides acrylics, natural woods are my favorites. Hardwoods. So. Yeah. Cool. Well, if anybody has any questions, like I say, fire away. Yeah. If not, we'll fuss them. Hey, Steve. I got one. Yeah, man. Um, I've only had my twenty-four for about two months. I don't think I have more than about 60, oh, I don't even know, maybe 50 hours of use on it. Um, my question is, is I am having a terrible time with position origins. It, it seems like either I can't, I'm not grasping the concept of, of you know, uh, absolute coordinates or, uh, you know, start wherever I want. Uh, I'll set it up that way. I'll move the laser to start at this point. And then when I hit start to do the cut, it goes all the way up to the, to the top left. Mm -hmm. and Are start, you hitting and start, What? On, on your control panel on the laser before you hit start, are you hitting the origin button to set where you want that laser to start from? No. Is that what I'm supposed there's Because looking yeah. in the manual, I don't see a lot of instruction on – that that button origin or frame on the controller itself 
Mm -hmm. So if you're going to use it from the controller, that's you're going to want to send instead of start. When you start from Lightburn, it sends the data over in little bitty pieces, and it never really hits the resident memory of the controller, and there are a number of issues that can happen there. But beyond that, um, if you want to use frame and start from the control panel, you need to send the file over to the control panel first, and then well, call the file up using the file button. Yeah, That's all I do, Brian. I have not tried running running any program would start from Lightburn because okay. just reading your <laughs> comments nobody recommends doing that right 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 so, so, so the I other did, thing I is um if you're if you're in absolute coordinates no matter how you set the origin it doesn't matter that only works in user origin so right. typically if you don't have a camera you're going to work in user origin and set your origin manually with the laser you know where you put your head each time and hit the origin button on the controller and that will um coincide with wherever your green box is around your artwork and how you have your start position selected within lightburn okay so but so when i send the file over to the to the controller is that when I would hit frame or origin then, or? Well, yeah, no, you, you need can, to you can hit origin whenever you want. So basically, what you're doing is you're going to move the laser head to your project piece where you okay. would like to start and hit origin. Within Lightburn, you're going to select user origin for your starting position. And okay. then when you send that over to the machine, it's going to look at where you set that origin and say, okay, that's where I'm going to start. When you bring the file up on the machine after you've set origin, if you hit frame on the machine, it will put a box around starting from where your origin is set. Okay. So if you ever hit frame and it moves, then you know that you need to go back and set your origin on the machine. So move your machine head back where you want it and press that origin button and you'll be good to go. And then hit frame again to double check. But yeah. <coughs> All I'm right. just going to draw something here real quick. Uh, I'm going to yeah. make that a tool layer and make it not. So here, here's the way that I normally use user origin. And here's my workflow. I'm going to just assume that I have a piece of 12 by 12 up on my Nova 35. Is that what? It, no. Yeah, I'm on the Nova 35. Uh, so I'll bring it back here and slide it to the back. I'll autofocus, you know, make sure the material's in front. Then I'll bring it up front where I can work on it a little easier. If I want this test to show up right here in the upper right hand corner here's going to be my workflow it doesn't matter where it is on the screen right now that matters only in absolute coordinates when you're in absolute coordinates everything's calculated from the corner from zero zero so literally where you drag it is where it's going to go but you don't know where this is because this grid does not define the honeycomb and you don't really know where these points are unless you find zero zero on your laser and make a jig or a fence or a guide or, or something camera right or if you have the camera you'll be an absolute so in user origin um you'll notice there's a job origin button here and you can change these radio buttons and it'll tell right. you can change where your origin is on your artwork so i'm going to choose upper left for that and let's say that i want to actually place that here on the artwork no matter or on the board no matter where the board is i'm going to manually jog my laser head over until the red dot is right in the upper left hand corner of the material and then i'll press the origin button on the controller and it'll just beep and you've just set the origin. So when you send that job, it will put that green box right where the red dot was when you press the origin button. Now I'll give you another example. Let's say I wanted to put it in the bottom right because that is where, you know, the area that I have left. I'll move my laser head to the lower right and press the origin button. So I've set my origin on the laser for this job. But here's what happens if I send this right now. It's going to do this because we did not define the job origin correctly in Lightburn so that your green box is on the lower right of your artwork. If we send it again, it'll do that. Does that make sense? I think so. I See, I, ne I was never ever touching the frame slash origin buttons on the controller at all. I okay. just thought Lightburn, because it just did, it just for some reason, like I said, it's just one of those brain fart things that, you know, you're, you're I'm assuming that Lightburn knows you know, where I, when I move the laser, when I move that the would, laser head to the corner of my board that that where I want it to start, I'm I'm assuming that light burn when I send that, that file hurt. to, yeah, to it, it, 
it knows, well, but it doesn't. Well, no, that's, that, that's current position, but it doesn't work good. <laughs> There's yeah, a bug yeah. in it. Uh, so the, the only difference is you have the right idea, but you have to tell the laser, hey, this is my origin. So you oh, need to press the origin to so define it. So go ahead. Go, it's all right. Yeah, because like I said, I was never, ever touching the origin button mm -hmm. on the on the controller. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's why. Yeah, I think that'll okay. take care of you. All right. Now I have one other goofy question. Sure. I happen to notice, and I, and I don't think this has got anything, there's anything actually wrong. But when I'm looking down on top of, on my honeycomb, my honeycomb is not square in other words yeah. the, the uh, rods that go through the honeycomb are not straight they're actually curved oops, is that kind of like a oops when they put it together or i think that's just the way it goes together um after they get all those pieces of that strip in there to make the honeycomb and they run those reinforcing rods through yeah i think maybe they just get off center i think that's just a manufacturing thing i don't i don't think it'll affect the you know how anything works it's a weird optical anomaly I, i'll give you yeah. that yeah it's, i mean sure you, if, if you're trying to use that for a point of reference for squareness don't bother because it's no, <laughs> right it's a it's a big arc it's 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 almost like a about an eight nine ten degree arc yeah, those rods aren't necessarily going to be uh, perfectly straight square. in there. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's it sits flat. I mean, moving the moving the thing all the way across the bed, it's perfectly flat. So, yeah. Okay, I'm I have one sure more question. Exactly How do, why that's way, but that is the way they are. It's not it's not abnormal. Uh, it's just. I come, I come from a Glowforge, and mm -hmm. I have a one a particular file that I run. I make like a Star Wars coaster, and the Glowforge obviously is incredibly slow, but, and I use MDF for this, but the actual engrave is very dark, which is what I want. Right. How the yeah. hell do I do that? I cannot so, seem to get it dark on the Nova. So think about your beam a lot, your laser as an open flame. You know, if you drag your hand across it really slow, it's going to burn. You're going to feel it the faster you go. It doesn't do quite yeah. so much. So your laser beam is kind of like that. So speed can have something to do with it. But one okay. of the main factors besides Glowforge having lower power, their smoke assist is different. Uh, but the main yeah. thing is the quality of the optics and the beam signature that we're able to output and the power that we use. It's so effective at burning that it doesn't char as much as the Glowforge. The Glowforge is actually probably not focused as well. The optics probably aren't as good so you get a fuzzier beam you're using a sharpie instead of a fine tip pencil does that make sense on the glowforge yeah. so on the thunder you have to fool it to do that so you could defocus by a few millimeters that'll right. soften the beam you could slow Try down that. a little and lower your lower your power a little bit and then the air assist and you know has something to do with that as well depending on the material yeah okay those hey, are the three the, things i had yeah and one one other thing about uh origin that i wanted to point out just uh because it's bitten me in the ass more than once i hate to say but um wherever you set that origin when you turn that machine off be prepared that when you turn it back on the machine goes through its reset cycle it's going to go all the way back to that left hand corner and then come back to where your user origin was set yeah so if you have anything in the way of that path your head of the laser is going to run right into it okay in other words, it automatically yeah. homes every time you turn it on, but it's going to move back to where you last set it. Yeah, yes. and there okay, are yeah. some settings in the machine settings, depending on what you're using, where after the job, now I don't know if this is the same on a reset or a, or a power up, but I know after the job's complete, you can tell it in certain modes whether it goes home or whether it goes back to the to right. the origin or whether it doesn't do anything it stays put but that may not affect during when on when you cycle on power up when it homes i don't know I'll, i mean I, I know the setting you're talking about I, I might test that yeah it's in the vendor settings i think somewhere in the yeah. in the depths of it you're yeah. muted little johnny <laughs> <laughs> i think i have tried that before and it didn't change it i think because you and i talked about that brian i think at one point in time yeah my game is now is if I got something in there, I try to reach in as fast as I can before it comes back. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's like I reach in really fast, like, okay, get out of there. Yeah. Don't forget the ever-present emergency stop button. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hit that thing like a whack-a-mole. That's what it's there for. 
what's even yeah. more fun is when you have like a little piece of something that kicks up out of there from the air when you're cutting and you try to reach oh, in yeah. there to beat the laser when it's running to try to reach in there so you don't get bit. Because is I always it, I always don't hit stop or pause. <laughs> is it, is it also pretty is it also pretty normal when you're doing engraving, you're using the wide tip um, that that thing gets really sooted up? Um, using the what? When you're using the wide nozzle, the six millimeter oh, nozzle. Yeah. You know, so um, here's the, here's the deal with that six millimeter nozzle. I, you need to introduce a lot of air to it because it's going to be a diffused air, which is what you're after. Um, and I think there'll actually be more disruption as you increase pressure. One thing that I noticed about that nozzle, the, the orifice is six millimeters in diameter, so you have a you know, a six millimeter hole that the air is going out. The airline is significantly smaller on the inside diameter. So logic oh, yeah. would say that it cannot provide enough power or enough airflow to keep that nozzle positively pressured. Does, does that make sense? So I can see where using that nozzle, if you don't really pour the air to it, it uh, can also foul the lens quicker. Um, okay. The lens isn't getting fouled. Uh, cause I, I, I check it. Like if I do like, uh, like a dozen coasters and then I check the lens, the lens is still pretty clean. It's just mm -hmm. that there's a lot of soot around the, the tip of that nozzle. Yeah. Well, so I, am, that, I, mean, I, I run a compressor. Right? I, I think they're the same size, at least by my measurement, the, the input and the output are six mil. The, well, the outside diameter of the airline is six mil. And unless it doesn't have a thickness, the inside diameter has to be smaller. Right, 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 right. Well, are you saying are you saying then you you no. don't need, you don't need to use the wide the wide no. nozzle for engraving? Well, I, I'm not saying that. Um, the problem with these uh, conical nozzles that shoot the air directly down or diffuse it like that other one, um, you know, the Glowforge had a smoke assist fan and it didn't really blow down on the work at all. It, it just kind of blew the smoke around so it wouldn't get on the lens. Right. Um, so the air delivery system has a lot to do with that. When you blow down in an engraving, since you're not cutting all the way through, there's nowhere for all of that spent gases and all that debris to go except back up out of the work. So it's kind of like sneezing in a flower bowl. You know, <laughs> it gets all over the nozzle and all over your work and everything. Whereas when you're cutting, it blows it out the bottom and it's exhausted and you have a pretty nice clean, you know, thing, because it, it just evacuates all of that stuff. But when you're engraving, there's nowhere for it to go. Um, the way to mitigate that is less air, is less direct air, so that it doesn't so forcefully blow that stuff around so that it sticks to all your work. There's not going to be a condition, I don't think, where you can keep that nozzle clean. It's going to get fouled over time. Well, I just, uh, in running this, I would just simply pause it and then go in with a little brush and just brush the tip off mm -hmm. so the chunks aren't laying on the on the on my material right and then right. then just start again right and that that's something that people with the hr head probably have to do a lot because the disc clearance there's yeah. like three millimeters and that thing's got a big flat head on it you know and that thing gets caked up really easy that that's really one of those, easy. to the point where it'll drag across your work and even affect it you know um, yeah i i uh the first time i screwed up my hr lens i was doing glass and it uh it covered the entire opening with glass particles, bounced the beam back up and, and cracked my lens. Well, I wound up uh, when I was engraving, trying to figure out how to make this engrave darker, I actually defocused. So I'm up actually, instead of six millimeters, I'm actually at about nine. Gotcha. Yeah. And, uh, and then I'm running at um, uh, 200 millimeters a second and 50% power. Gotcha. That ought to give you a really good burn, actually. It's it's decent. It's still not as again. It's still not as dark as the Glowforge, but yeah, I suppose I could either up the power or slow it down a little bit to get a little darker. Yeah, well, you can do the borax too. You know, uh, I tried that today, and yeah. I'm getting a lot of flame. Yeah, you will, or you can. Um, and if you're getting a lot of flame, you probably have too much borax in your solution. You just could need be. less. I probably dumped about maybe two not a lot. in a cup. Maybe oh, not I, in a fair either. I, I yeah. missed something. Yeah. What what are you using borax water. in? Water. You, the, you coat the board with with a water dissolve put some borax in water and then you dissolve it in there and then you literally paint the board and let it dry yeah. before you and try engraving. 
it'll give um, you a darker so, burn. So here, here's what I can tell you. So we we carry two or we make two solutions here. One of them is a borax and water solution, but we do not use that one for laser engraving. We use that one for our um, electrical Lichtenbergs. Um, if you want better results, uh, same same ratios, but use baking soda and water. And it'll give you much darker results. Okay. Plus, you don't have the risk of not it flaming up. Not that. from what I, but yeah, you're giving it a try. Yeah, have you tried that, it that yet, was Brian? The original, that was the original no. formula that came out before the Kenny Hack. I think that's rust, isn't it, where they use – I think the Kenny Hack is where you uh, oxidize steel wool in water and put that on there. But I would think that would make a mess. I don't know. There's yeah, a couple of different really solutions that people that have come up with. Your foot too. Yeah. Hmm. Don't turn everything orange. <laughs> Yeah, the, yeah, the a, biggest thing is because when you do borax in water, it is, it's flammable. But if you do yeah. baking soda in water, it's not. Um, yeah. I so, know it's a good flame. <laughs> yeah, 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 probably a nice green one too. <laughs> so no, you, you have to be it's careful. Green, believe it or not. I don't know why, but it it's not a green flame. It never really? is. It's, yeah, it's more white. Yeah. Huh, interesting. Yeah. Really so, odd. Yeah, you just just be careful because when you burn borax, you don't want to be breathing that stuff in. That's pretty nasty fume. Um, yeah, you're too cautious, so, Travis. Well, I, I've got employees I have to watch out for. <laughs> we don't. Just us. Leave us alone. All right. Oh. But, but in that case, just uh, use some magnesium in water. They'll go great. <laughs> white phosphorus. Yeah, white you phosphorus. Don't need Without wow, the wide miss. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the same at five to one. Can you guys still that? hear and see me? My computer just crashed. My video card. All my monitors are blinking. As long as you can still hear me, I'm good. I can see you and hear you. I'm glad it's okay. the TV <laughs> organizer. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I guess it's Brian, time for a new video send card. You a new computer. <laughs> I don't. Well, I just I just upgraded this thing. Maybe uh, Thunder should get you a decent computer. Wait, you just oh, upgraded well. that? You did an amazing job. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't have $1,200 for a video card. So. Well, have Thunder get you one. Your tech support, you have to do this stuff. Thunder should be getting you a top of the line. Yeah. Well, it is. The problem is I haven't run that chiller to it yet. I, I'm just overheating the thing because I'm pushing it to its limits. It's starting to come back up. And when are so. you getting a Mac? I actually have a Mac uh, MacBook Air sitting right here that I yeah, just updated to Catalina, or I think is the th latest one I can put on it. So I've actually been playing with that now, and I've You're got NDI run. Right? So uh, no, actually parts of I'm it I kind of like. So at least well, I have an idea. I got a Linux hey. box over here too, so I'm I'm playing with Lightburn on Linux also. Oh, nice. All right, I can help you out with some of the Mac stuff because I'm a hundred percent. Mom? Gotcha, gotcha. As are, as well, I'm we. learning it little by time. My my daughters help me with it because they're all Mac stuff too. So for that borax, was that was the same ratio, or for the uh, baking soda order, that's still at five to one. He's not on right now. He's chasing the kids. Driving, driving <laughs> I was doing ten to one on the borax, though, not five to one. I thought I heard him say that, yeah, it was the same ratio. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I'm assuming I'm assuming that. Usually, because I don't do a like 10 to 1 or 5 to 1, um, I do it's uh, two tablespoons for 16 ounces of water. So whatever that ratio is. Writing that down. Well, that would have been my problem then because I had about two teaspoons and about four ounces of water. Yeah, be a little yeah, we, were, we mix up full spray bottles at a shot. Yeah, that was that was way probably way too strong of a solution then. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and you'll you'll know if you get too much baking soda in there, because I'll start turning your wood gray. Um, because that's also a, a trick. You mix a if you mix heavier um baking soda in the water and spray it and let it dry, oh, it's God. a way to um increase the aging effect of wood yeah it helps mm -hmm. the that, that nice weathered sea wood look or works wood. really good on oak yep works really yeah, good on reaction tan. anything with high tannins it'll work on 
Okay, Brian, I got a question for you. All righty. Who do we do? Do we send an email to you? Do I call Grant uh, ordering new lenses? What's the procedure? If I have them on parts.thunderlaserusa.com, you can click an order right there, and I can usually okay. have them to you in one to three days. If I'm out, then they do have them in Texas, in which case you can email your rep or admin at thunderlaserusa.com, and they'll shoot some out to you that way with about the same uh, turnaround on them. Okay, we've got some funky spots on ours, so not sure, and I might as well just get a couple extra. Yeah, I mean, you can source some on Amazon through CloudRay or something like that, or Light Object. Uh, they've been doing us real good on tubes. Uh, and if I need an air pump or something yeah. that I don't have handy, I'll go through uh, Marco at Light Object for that stuff. So we've kind of developed a little, and they have some good optics too. They're US optics, I think. I think they're 2.6. Um, but I, if you do source them elsewhere, make sure you get a good US optic. There are some CVD optics or some 2.6 optics out there that are actually marked made in China. Um, and those may not be as good a quality. I saw a post the other day talking about the optical differences, the color, you know, uh, of the different lenses. And that can mean something, but it doesn't necessarily mean anything. Um, but typically right. the ones that we have are more yellowish, not as orange uh, on the 2.6 lenses. And APC, I think, is the same way. Their zinc selenide looks about the same uh, hue. But you just got to be careful sourcing uh optics from eBay and places like that, because there's no telling, it might be melted Pepsi bottles for all you know. We don't order from you. We typically will go through like American Photonics. Um, yeah. Yeah. Walter's got good optics over there. I figure if he makes optics good enough for the military and NASA, that's good enough for our lasers. Well, that's our <laughs> so. four inch lenses through them. But mm -hmm. you know, Oh yeah, that kit. Yeah, the the extension oh, and everything yeah, with the lens. How do you like that, Tommy? Um, uh, well, we've got one for the the boss, yeah. and um, the one point five two two and a half work fantastic. The four it doesn't align um, uh -huh. with everything else for some reason, but the four on the Thunder has been fantastic. <laughs> We didn't get the whole kit. We just bought the four inch. Just the yeah. four. Yeah, it's Brian, don't forget. Clean. Um, it, you know, you don't ever put it in your hands. You take it apart, you clean it right there, and you know, because it's glued into the housing. All right. That's just what I was going to ask. If that thing is glued in, you can't. Uh, can you can you get at the lens good enough to clean it? So this is the four inch um the four inch we got for the thunder. Yeah. So you twist and then the lens is oh, okay. mounted inside of there. You don't have to use that little metal thing and twist or anything. And then occasionally I'll take the those swap <laughs> things. Yeah, I know this is probably very inappropriate looking. And stick it in the hole. <laughs> I, didn't even, I didn't even think that until she said that. Me neither. My bad. I'm not able to see this. I just had one have of my boys it. come back and go, have you seen my half-naked child run by? Like, nope. <laughs> I thought this was going to be a cleaner show. <laughs> I'm here. I, I didn't even do it this time. Yeah, apparently not with Lois on the show. <laughs> We try, we try. So, so Lois, on that on that lens, so the other side of the lens is not as easily accessible then, right? You have Correct. to reach down in there. Okay. Correct, That's but I've thing. done it because I noticed on the Boss, because that's the only lenses we're running on the Boss right now is the Benny kit. Yeah. Um, we're not using the, the one that came with it because um, this is all just really easy in the Boss. Um, to just use these. Unfortunately, like he said, we haven't gotten the um, the four inch, you know, dialed in. Not sure what the problem is, but now I don't need it on the boss because I have the the thunder. Um, sure. I just take like the Q tip or whatever and stick it in the inside so it goes down, and then you can kind of wiggle yeah. it. It doesn't ever really get dirty though. 
in the bosses. I didn't notice uh, running it on the thunder though, so I don't know if that's a difference in the air or what. Probably. Um, those those Q-tips that she just had, those green ones that came with the laser. Anybody know where you get those? Amazon. Like, yeah, you go on Amazon and look for clean room or optical swab. Optical. They're, they've got, they're on Amazon. Yeah, um, they're clean room swabs or optical swabs, foam tip yeah. optical swabs. Yeah, go we, so we we get ours. They're labeled as a DTG clean or head cleaning swabs, um, mm -hmm. and they're cheaper than the optical ones, but they're the same exact thing. Oh yeah, that, like for all the, the I've, nobody has a VCR that I know of, but yeah, that used to be real popular for cleaning the heads on those cassettes yep. and stuff. What about the Zeiss wipes? You can use them. Um, Look, those yeah, MO mirrors alcohol. that are in these things, you could spit on them and clean them in your T-shirt, and it would probably be okay. But um, <laughs> those wipes are okay as long as you don't squeeze that lens too 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 much. You still need to be gentle with it because they are coated. Uh, the lenses are so you don't want to bear yeah. down real hard, but you can use those. I, I use those wipes too sometimes. Yep, the, Ze the Zeiss wipes are the ones I use also. Yeah. Hey, I got the goofy question. So let's say you want to make okay. a cut and a long cut, but you only need to, you have two factory edges, right? So let's say the top and one side are factory edges. All you need to do is cut a line across the bottom and the line going up. Can you do that? Yeah. Just draw two lines or, or draw a rectangle and then uh, note edit and take two of them away, two of the sides away. Because I'm trying to figure out how to cut down some of my burn time. Yeah, when you do that, you know, to line it up right, you may want to extend your cut past the end of your uh piece by an eighth inch or something just yeah to make or, sure. or draw a tool layer that's the entire size of of the area that you want to cut out and then draw yeah. you know the two areas just lines and use your tool layer as you know to move your head over and line up your corners so you could do yeah. that too yep. so and we do something similar to that kind of so when we bring in the five by five sheets of baltic birch um, we cut them and cut them down into half, um, so they fill up the bed of our uh, 63. Um, so we've got a got one preset that's just called uh, sheet cut in the memory on the machine. So we load it up and uh, knock the wood against the back edge of the machine, which is always going to be straight to the wood and straight to the gantry. Um, and then uh, we just rip it right in half and pull it out and load the next sheet in, just sit there and. You know, we spend about an hour and rip down a full pallet of uh, five by five birch into half sheets. Nice. Why not just throw it right. on the table saw? Yeah, because you have a Clean. laser. <laughs> cleaner, yeah, I have a laser and it's cleaner cuts. Than a, a table question. saw? Yeah, than a table saw. You have to remember, I don't have a thousand dollar table saw like you. I've got the three ninety nine. DeWalt special. <laughs> <laughs> I had a question while I'm uh, gassing up because I know I'll hurt everyone's ears if I talk while I'm going down the toy. Um, let's talk compressors for a second. I was looking at uh, California Air. Is it worth getting the dryer and the regulator that yes. they sell with their compressors? Yes. You yeah. have to run a dryer. 100%. What about the dryer versus the ultra dry, which is 98% dry? So I have like a, it's like a filter, it's on like your climate. oil filter. Where do you live? I live in Where Illinois. Do you live? How humid is it? <laughs> it's humid in the summer. Oh. Yeah, so you want as dry as possible air, and if you live in a humid environment, you want the the more drying capacity that you can get. So that, do yeah. those work pretty good? It looks like like a big oil filter, like off a diesel truck, is all that's on there, like for the dryer. It's like a that's what it spins off. You replace it every six months, I think they say, or something. Right. Yeah, you you can get a lot longer out of them than that. So I've got three of the California Air Tools compressors. Um, they're all in their silent cabinet um, with the air dryer and the auto drain setup. Um, and there's more to it than just that big silver thing that spins <laughs> off. Because um, they actually have active coolers on there as well. 
that gotcha. uh, fills the air before to force it to condense before it goes through that drying unit. Um, but yeah, I get you know 98 to 99 percent uh, dry air through them. Well, if I wanted to uh, possibly run some other stuff off of it down the road, like maybe a small uh, uh, sandblaster or something with that that 20 gallon two horse, I think it is, or it's got two uh, heads on it. Yeah, the, it's a 20 gallon four horse. Um, Not well, the, 80 10, the 8010 those, is an eight gallon one horse, and it's got two. It looks like it's it's two cylinder also. So it, it depends okay. on which you're talking about. Well, it, and no, yeah, those are not continuous to be pumps by any means. The 8010 yeah. isn't. I think it's yeah. Uh, oh, yeah those are those are 4200 bucks. Yeah. yeah. I, oh, yeah. You're looking at the big the big dudes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So the big I, ones. I've got the little um, cheap one. Yeah, so the the big ones, the four horse twenty gallon. Um, I've got I do have one of those right now. It's down. Um, I blew a motor on it, um, so I'm waiting for a replacement motor. Um, it really depends. I and mean, if you're just running a single uh, laser and occasionally running other stuff off of it, I mean, one of those would be just fine. Um, we're looking at because I've got five air compressors total in my shop. We're looking at consolidating down to one big screw drive system. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're we're finally at that point where you know it's having five air compressors run just sucks. <laughs> and to run that, that small of a too. and to run that small of a tank on uh, for sandblasting, I don't see it working. No, no, for sandblasting, even no smaller way. sandblasters. I, I I've got a small little cabinet sandblaster that just runs off a standard air hose. Um, but it drains down my 20 gallon tanks in no time flat. Um, when I'm running oh. that, I usually daisy chain a couple of my air compressors together. Oh, now, gotcha. You're, you're going to have to have something like an 80 pounder, 80 pounder, a gallon tank yeah. that's two stage yeah. to keep up. And and even on the small sand blasters that just run standard air hose, I mean, you're still, you need a minimum, I'd say, of eight or a, was it eight gallons or, or eight cubic feet a minute or whatever it is. Uh, probably, like just, probably just like an open hose when you're using one of those, right? And yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I had a, a chance to buy a nice big air or a sandblaster until I realized what the air requirements were. And the hose um, that came off the compressor, so the air compressor sat inside of a generator uh, shed, and the whole unit to just provide the air was the Connex. Uh, but you know that hose was a good two inch in diameter. I mean, thing was massive. Wow. So just for a Thunder Fifty One, then you'd recommend that smaller one, Brian, the 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 whatever that common one everyone seems to recommend. So I, I, well, I, that one is not continuous duty, and I don't use my machine all the time. So for a hobbyist oh, gotcha. and light duty, it's fine. Um, you know, but it uh, now I I have a cheap twenty dollar dryer, you know, regulator, one of those Amazon specials uh, right. on that eighty ten, and in August the humidity is higher probably here than it is anywhere, unless you're in Louisiana or something, or Florida, and um, it, it I've had to drain I've had to drain the trap twice, you know, in two hours. I mean, it'll fill up that fast, um, but it yeah. seems to do its job. Um, but I, again, I don't use it heavily. You know, Travis is in a position where he's doing production, so he can look at a 12K, you know, $12,000 screw drive and, and make it matter. And I can't because I just tinker. One of the things <laughs> you can do too to help with that is like I'm running two dryers, two separators online. But one of the bigger things is too is actually having one dryer closer to your compressor and then having a longer feed, keeping your compressor further away from your unit as possible. To let it cool down so that your second dryer can work. Yep. Because that and, way and my air is cooling you know, down. So I got a long, a decently long run just to deliberately cool my air down. Yeah. So, and if you have the room, I mean, you can put your, you can build your own air uh, condensing system really easy uh, with some copper tubing. Um, and basically, it's basically got a big run and kind of zigzags the air around and it has legs at the bottom where your uh, condensation collects at. Uh, yeah. But they're really now, easy to put together. Now, also think the, you know, the 8010 that I have is going to have a really, it's got small cylinders. It's got a small bore. So it's going to create a lot of heat uh, and not create a lot of air. 
if you have one that you're looking at a four horse you know 20 gallon you're going to be able to produce four times as much volume of air the temperature is going to be lower there's going to be less condensation because it's not running so hard and then when you get up to yep. the bigger you go uh, the less condensation you're going to have because you're not going to be going from 200 degree temperatures down to 70 as soon as it hits the tube and starts going out uh, because your temperatures right. are going to be cooler in the head to begin with. So, and it depends on how much you're going to use it. You know, uh, is, is it going to be continuous duty where your compressor's running all day long while you work, or is it going to be this deal where you turn it on, you know, and run a couple hours and then work on another project? You know, so that'll determine. And the only time really? it's really going to work super hard is if you're cutting. Yeah, and, and what air I think, you're using on engraving, you're not using that much air. Yeah, yeah. And, and what mm -hmm. I can tell you is when you're cutting um, off of one of the 110 volt uh, two horse uh, silent compressors from California Air Tools, um, you can comfortably run two thunders off of that at about between 30 and 40 psi. And it'll cycle, it'll be on, um, you know, 45 minutes out of every hour, which is right at their cycle duty limit. Um, so, I mean, if you're running less than, you know, two or less thunders, then one of those should be fine. Um, once you get adding additional stuff, like if you say, okay, hey, I'm going to run a single thunder, but then I also need to run, you know, impact wrench, or I need to run this tool or whatever, then you need to start looking at upgrading. And right now, um, when my uh, four horse died, I had to uh, run to a shop and just grab a, a compressor really quick. And I picked up one. I didn't. I I was dead set that it was just going to be temporary. I didn't want to like it. Um, it was just uh, <laughs> got it from Lowe's. It was um, a Craftsman oil bath uh, belt driven one. It was about seven hundred bucks. And I'll tell you what, that thing it's it's loud, but it's not obnoxiously loud because it's a, a much bigger bore, so it's a deeper tone, so it doesn't bug you. And with it being oil bath, that thing's rated for a 100% duty cycle. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, if you can get away with handling a little bit of the noise, right now, that's actually my favorite go-to uh, compressor for smaller really? users. Now, a lot of people talk about that, what is it, a Husky, that Quiet Tech or whatever? Um, yeah. We're getting that one and having better results or, or saying that they like it better than the Cali Air sometimes. I think it's got a bigger capacity and higher horsepower. Yep. Yeah. But the, a, uh, uh, oil bath a, one will definitely be a much better, you know, long, long term investment. Those oil free ones, they're designed to burn out the pistons over time. Um, and that's where the oil bath ones come into account. Plus, you're also dealing with um, stuff that's replaceable on them because they're a belt driven system. So if you fry a motor, you can buy just the motor. Um, or if you right. buy a compressor head, you can buy a compressor head. No. They have a tendency right. of running cooler too, just because they are oil. Yep. Yeah. Okay, well, oh, it runs a hell of a lot cooler. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I have I a, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've got a 20 gallon, and I just bought a, the a quiet one, but it's by Menards, but it's mm -hmm. you know it's an oilless one. But when I'm cutting, that thing is running a lot. So mm -hmm. I went and I bought a 10 gallon auxiliary tank. So now I basically yes. have 30, 30 gallons of air instead of 20, and it's not running an anywhere near as, as often. Because you are using yeah. a lot of air when you're cutting. Does it does it run into the duty cycle having to fill that extra tank though? Well, I you know I I don't really pay attention to it that way. If it's going to burn yeah. out, it's going to burn out. I mean, <laughs> if, it, if it burns out, I'll eventually just go buy a bigger compressor right away. Yeah. 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 But I mean, I'm only using a, a Nova 24, but when you're cutting, you're using a lot of air. I mean, just... yeah, yeah. You know, and the size of the machine technically for the air assist doesn't matter. The machines are, you know, plumbed and designed the same way. Um, yeah. So, yeah. so you, you'll you use just as much air cutting half inch on your Nova 24 as somebody would maybe on the 130 effectively. I've never seen any use for going over probably about 20 or 25 or 30 PSI anyway. There's a diminishing point of return there. Um, Another thing you, I'm sorry. Another thing you can ahead. do to help with water as well that I never hear talked about is putting in drip legs. It's like coming out of my compressor for my first dryer, I've actually got a drip leg and then it goes into the dryer and then it comes back across and before it goes into my other dryer i've got another drip leg and then it goes in the dryer 
So that way, any of the heavier waters and stuff are going to drop into that drip leg, and then you can just empty your drip legs out. Yeah, dryer doesn't have to work so hard. Yeah. Yep. Are you saying not to have? Uh, just reading the instructions on the Thunder site, though, you're saying that that two-stage uh, filter system that everybody seems to be buying off of Amazon. I thought the instructions said to set that for put 50 psi to that thing. Well, that's the maximum. You don't have to set it to that. Oh, okay. So I'm probably running probably too much air when I'm cutting. Um, yeah, the system limit is 55 PSI. Uh, if you run any more than that, you run the risk of damaging the seats on the air solenoids uh, okay. and things like that. So. Well, I can turn it down easy enough. Yeah, mine set of. Well, I think I'm less than 40. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, and, you know, like I said, most people find that once you get up past 30, it doesn't do much. There's not a lot more benefit after that anyway. So you don't have to set it at 55. You know, uh, that's okay. just the maximum that we recommend. And that's been changed a few times. And they've even changed the solenoids. They went to SMC solenoids now. Uh, Holy mackerel. What's a good alternative if you are looking at an oil compressor? Like, I know Ingersoll Rand used to be the shit, and now they're sold everywhere. I think they sold out. You know, they're, you can buy them anywhere now. What's a good brand of those? Ingersolls are still good workhorses. We had yeah, them in our Yeah, they are shop. still. That's my dream is one of those big screw drive Ingersoll Rands. It's about $14,000. <laughs> three phase no yep. well, you, you get one of those and then uh have you ever seen their refri their refrigerated air drying units no oh they're magical <laughs> i can't see anything right now but i'll google that a little later um, you know, like that, that, travis you I just run your air hose outside to cool it don't you not during the summer <laughs> we still get hot up here during the summer yeah. for what, what two like weeks? 60 no, occasionally the low 90s. Um, but up, the weird thing is, you go uh, about six hours north of us to Fairbanks. Yeah, and uh, they'll go from 40 and 50 below zero during the winter to 110 above in the summer. No kidding. <laughs> how, how would you like to live in that kind of weather shift? 98 degrees. Oh, thanks. Oh, oh. I so, saw a zero breaking up. Yeah, he froze. Yeah, I got a question on, on uh, has anybody ever had a problem like when they're uh, uh, it's like I have a high assist on or whatever for like cutting or whatever, and when it, it starts the job, it goes to the low side for whatever reason. I mean, yeah, it's because you like start, a, you need to send. Okay. But I'm like, man, it's like kind of like a hit and miss. I mean, like sometimes it'll do it, and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. You know, that's a known okay. that's a known problem. That's been an issue for a while, just because of our weird firmware and our uh, extra stuff. Because most lasers don't have dual stage air assist, so you don't have to like navigate through that stuff. But when you start, it streams the data, and there's lots of uh, file corruption and some things like that, and there is a sequencing issue. So if you send or shift plus send instead of start. Uh, you won't have those problems, and it'll also reduce file transfer errors and file corruption. So. Yeah. Um, hey, Jim or Johnny, I still can't see, uh, and I'm going to have to jump off here and reboot this computer so I can answer questions. Can you kick me off of the session, and you can do turn off the recorder, do whatever you want to do, and uh, I'll get my system back up and running. And I am working on, uh, I uploaded another webinar today. I'm finally getting some time so I can get caught up on the YouTube channel and get all those uploaded and get us back recent on that stuff too. Was you talking so, to me, Brian, because I just walked away. Yeah, I was going to see if you could <laughs> kick me off the session and hit, and hit the record button uh, to stop it. Um, and I'm going to reboot my computer and get back on the 